I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning into the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and today I've got a full table to my left, Marketing Director Neil Davies, and across the table, the Assistant Director of Engineering, Joe Thielen, and former Senior Ballistic Scientist, Dave Emery. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. Good to be here. Good to be here, buddy. Yeah, this is an important show because not only are you guys uh, had your hand in a bunch of cool stuff and products and all of this, there's a little product that, that a couple people have heard of uh, called the 6.5 Creedmoor. I don't know if you guys remember that at all, but uh, it's it's kind of a thing. Don't know if it'll take off. Yeah, it's kind of a flash in the pan cartridge is really what it is. America doesn't like 6.5s. Yep, that's tr- <laughs> okay. yep. truer words have never been spoken. Uh, and we say that in jest, obviously, because the 6.5 Creedmoor, as uh, as Neil has coined, was the, the overnight success that took 10 years. And uh, there are a few light bulbs that can stay on in our factory because of 6.5 Creedmoor sales. It's been a tremendously high-performing cartridge for us, both in the sales world and out in the field and mm-hmm. using it. And we've all taken this cartridge on hunts, matches, had our kids shoot it. I mean, it's just so versatile. And that all started, you know, I mean, there's a village that is required to do everything, but the guys around this table, excluding myself, of course, uh, really saw this thing from conception to finished product. And, uh, you know, we've got, I brought some, for those viewers watching, I have some uh, trinkets on the desk here. Yeah, what you got there? I have a sizing die that's labeled 6.5-30TC from the the R&D lab. I have what I'm guessing is uh, a size die used to form brass, uh, a forming die. And here's a, a piece of history. That says Dave's Icon, 143 oh, ELDX, yeah. 15 off the rifling. That's probably getting close to 10 years ago. Yep, yeah. so a dummy round from uh, when the 143 ELDX would have been first developed. And that taper die has an X on it, like XJ, which is Experimental Joe from the case plant. So that is the original steel die to taper down the first cases that were ever if, made. All right. There it is. You saw it here, folks. So, XJ, Experimental Joe, Joe Thielen. Well, appreciate you experimenting. And before we dive too much into 6.5 Creedmoor, this conversation really can't start until we go back far enough to encompass the 30TC and, and that involvement with Thompson Center. So, um, Hopefully you guys had your coffee this morning and uh, let's go back to the 30 TC. And if we need to go back a little further than that, we can, but uh, the 30 TC is really the start of the 6.5 Creedmoor story, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was 2004. And Dave, I didn't- Probably five or six. I didn't work here until 2005. Because Creedmoor was, was seven. Yeah, but we, we were working on it in seven, six. Four, eight. Yeah. I'm thinking it was- f- yeah, it was in the four five range. Okay, because um, it, yeah, it was right when I started when we were, but the TC had kind of been done because I didn't really do much development on that case. Okay, so right around like Dave said, two thousand four, two thousand five, you're yeah. working on the thirty TC, and what was the impetus to make another mid size thirty cal cartridge? Well, that was right when Thompson Center, when it was still Thompson Center, came out with the Icon, and yeah. this fine was, rifle. Oh, was, I've still got one of the originals. I'll never get rid of that thing. Yeah. But um, Jason Hornady and Greg Ritz, who was the you know owner manager of TC at that time, were very very close friends. And Greg came out here, and we all went out to dinner, and he yeah. announced, "Hey, we're chicken you, coop. You, you were part of that too, yeah. weren't you? Yeah, we were at the chicken coop. And you know, I'm doing this new rifle, and it's all this great stuff and everything else, and I want my own branded cartridge, and it." turned into you know what can we do to try to give this thing some sort of unique characteristics that it might have some kind of a angle to be successful and we decided to go with you know a short fatter minimum taper cartridge can get long ogi bullets in it if you wanted to make a at the time, we were even thinking maybe you could even possibly get this thing in a short action instead of just a standard length action. Right. And, you know, it's what we came up with. It was kind of the first time we started. Uh, the, 
Well, the TC was a follow-on. The, the propellant development now was a follow-on to the uh, RCMs, where we okay. were kind of first starting to make, you know, purpose-built powders for a, a cartridge. Yeah, which would kind evolve into... Super performance kickoff, right, yeah, essentially. It, okay. it, it was the start of what turned into super performance. Okay, so in this little short cartridge, what did that super performance-esque type propellant gain you from a ballistic standpoint? Oh, it was better than 200 foot per second. I mean, you had this little itty bitty 30 caliber cartridge that was at or better than 30 out six ballistics. Okay. So it wasn't a slouch by any means. No, it was not a slouch cartridge. It was a good cartridge. It was accurate. I mean, mm-hmm. we... It's what the 308 Winchester could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's one yeah. Of those, kind of a 308 yeah. improved almost when That's, you look at the yeah. shoulder angle. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, the, the cartridge itself was the first time I think we had ever really seriously dabbled into you know a, a minimum taper sharp shoulder mm. shorter cartridge in order to give you room for getting long ogi bullets in them okay which that's an interesting point because from that then and so many other things that have come with you know that's been the recipe for it has. success for a bunch of the cartridges and that a, we did introduce like neil said it's it's kind of the recipe so i'm guessing the uh chamber dimensions and tolerances was use that same recipe that we're still using today from a dimensional standpoint. Mm-hmm. It did. As I recall, we had a, Joe, you got to help me here. I think we went with a 1,000th over bullet diameter throat net thing. On the 30? Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, in order to try to get better accuracy. And as I recall, any of them that I ever shot were really quite accurate for yep. an out-of-the-box factory rifle. Awesome. Well, you did a good job with the cartridge and, yeah, with the prevalency of 308 and 30-06. It, it was up against some stiff competition. And then as the story goes, uh, Thompson Center, um, I don't know if they shrugged off the cartridge, but they were sold and that cartridge became slightly less popular. Yeah. Another, another fun fact that, you know, on the Icon gun, this, it's a real small world, but so George Gardner had something to do with uh, helping them with the design for the oh, really? Icon action. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. And yeah. those are slick action, 60 they're, degree throw, and they were elegant. They're a nice action. Oh gosh, it's a they smooth were, action. They were on a roll. They had the yep. Warlord too, so they had a full kind of uh, PRS style, but, well, not well really back then, that, but yeah. yeah. Field match kind of thing. Yeah, flat on the bottom of the receiver. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was real cool action. Well, the 30TC got a lot of treatments that we give our current cartridge development. And it was kind of the founder of the feast, if you will. So, Dave, Joe, you guys are working on the 30TC. At what point was it an immediate, hey, we need we need to start shrinking this thing down? Uh, or when did that step down to 6.5 really occur? Well, and what was the, the parent case for this? What, what did you base it off of? Well, I mean, it was a shortened 308. Yeah, that's all it was, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, the Creedmoor. Y- yeah. Or, and the 30. Yeah, and the yeah. 30. Yeah. 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 It, it, was a sh- it was a short. Real quick, I know I just asked about when you necked it down to 6.5, but before we get there, um, I want to hear your opinion on, uh, or not your opinion, but why you selected the 30-degree shoulder angle. Uh, I know we get this question a lot, and I know how I answer it, but I want to hear how you answer it, because there's a lot of people that will come up to us at trade shows and stuff, and why is it not 40 or 35? Why did you select 30? So 30... Um, when you're forming cartridge brass and making cases, the, when you get a shoulder too steep, mm-hmm. you get fallout. They don't form as well. It's harder to keep the necks concentric in thickness and all that. Cause the material does not want to flow around a sharp corner. Okay. So 30 is a very, Happy I'm going to say a sweet spot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It heads. So the cartridge head spaces positively head spaces very well. It doesn't grow that much from firing to firing. Cause then you got to trim your cases all the time. So match shooters, you know, we're busy loading a lot of ammo and then number three and probably more importantly you can form a lot of good quality cartridge cases okay. very consistently yep and that's uh it's probably you that that uh shared that with me but for the listeners out there that's why you'll see the 30 degree shoulder on most of the cartridges that that we release i think probably since this one I, i've written on that in a couple articles too and just you know, probably where the rubber meets the road it's like as a mass producer you get a lot less scrap with a 30 yeah. degree shoulder doesn't want to hunch what's the start? 65 284 shoulder uh we really check that two or right? five because we shoulder. always had problems yeah it's, 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 it's they're hard to make yeah. it's a little steeper yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, neil while you look that up uh jamie just pulled this up for us rather preston 
Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a 308 5 Sammy spec on the throat diameter. Okay, so the, it was, was 5 over. Yeah, five it was over. 5 tenths over then. That was the first time we, well, the 17 HMR was the first really time started we started that. But we applied this to a center fire. Yep. yep. And it definitely took off. So you've got the 30 TC. The accuracy is great. Uh, you've got what became Superformance propellant. And then you, when did, when was that? Okay, let's neck this thing down. 35 degree. 35. 35 yeah. on the 65284. Hard to make. Yep. Yeah. All right. So when, when was it that it was like, was it instant? Were you always, cause Dave, we know you're a tinkerer. We've heard this. Were you working on the 30 TC and the whole time going, man, I'm going to neck that thing oh, down. No, no, this no. was a, uh-uh. are you going to, the Camp Perry? Written yeah. That? Well, it was, that was 2006 the, at Camp Perry. We, Joe and I went and, and Neil. shot and. Right, you were yeah, in the you were in the there. condo. Yeah, with Dennis DeMille yeah, was, and yep. uh, Greg Kantorovich. Right. Yep, we we went and shot the service rifle week at Camp Perry, and Dennis DeMille was there. Who, of course, was a very good friend of all of ours at the time. He was a general manager for Creedmoor Sports, and he had been competing with the Tub Two Thousand and Six XC for three, four, years. five in, years in NRA across the course. Yep, yeah, and. We sat down one day after the competition. He said, I am so frustrated with the 6XC cartridge because I'm just, all the loading data out there is, as far as I can figure, too hot because I have hard bolt lift, I have drop primers, I have pierce primers. And he said, I'm just, I'm fed up with this thing. I want something where I can go in any gun shop and I can buy an off-the-shelf round of match ammo and put it in my gun and go be competitive. Yep. That's a tall order in that 2006. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. It was. Yeah, it is. Because you did not win those matches without hand loading. But, I mean, he was sick of buying brass, depending on whatever brass he could get, sizing it. Yeah, and it's loading. a wildcat. It it was, yeah. So he went through a list of kind of performance parameters that he wanted. And, again, ease of loading, commercially available dies. We should have wrote those down, or did we write those down somewhere? Because it was, <sighs> I know one of them was... Positional stuff one and of, recoil yeah. was one of them. One of them was this cannot have too much recoil to hurt me in position shooting, like sitting or something mm-hmm. like that. And then the other one was it has to be, it has to be awesome at six hundred yards. Yeah, he said he this, this has got to be a true long range load. cartridge. Oh, any other thing? He said I want the load recipe on the label on. Oh the box. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Oh wow, well, that's that where that one. came from. Yep, yeah. that was okay. Dennis Demille. All right. But he didn't, he didn't, there was no design characteristics. It wasn't, he was, yeah, no, he just had a performance. Six, parameters. a six, five, a 30, or whatever. It he was didn't never care what it was. It was just, these, are the, the these are the performance parameters or characteristics that I'm, I'm looking for out of a cartridge that will work great for across the course shooting. Yep. And I would say, as I remember, Joe, we were sitting there with Dennis and you and I batted this around for oh. five to 10 minutes. And then we kind of came to, Hey, you know, if you want ballistic performance and you want low recoil, this is about got to be six five, because those are some of the best bullets out there in terms of and it BC was for weight, barrel life too. Yeah, he said it was, the six yep, millimeters. Was, yep. He was yeah. Eating, he said, they shoot a lot of rounds and yep. heat and everything, and he's like, yep, I got to have that's something right. that's consistent throughout the whole day. So yeah, we're like, that's a six, six five. five sounds really good. And I can rem- I remember telling Dennis, hey, we got this thirty. TC cartridge, which is basically a short 308 cartridge, which would be perfect for this because you can get these real long OJIVE 6.5s in this thing and mm-hmm. a standard 2.8 magazine yep. length. Yep. And that's I, literally that's where it came that's from. That's literally was, yeah. yeah. That's, at any point in that conversation, did you guys talk about the 260 Remington, which was at the time not, it was never been widely popular, but it was being shot at that point, or was that even in the conversation? No, we, we discounted no. it right off the bat because it's like it's a full 308 length okay. case, and you cannot get these long ogive bullets in this right. thing without running them into the lead and the rifling. Got it. So and, you got to have a kind of a start from scratch mentality. And we kind of went away from the uh, 6.5 284 almost immediately because it's like it'll have too much recoil. Too much recoil, yep. And I know, Dave, this was part of the time because I have notes in this book. That's when we started doing, um, or however we were, were doing it, but we started really paying attention to the bore diameter and volume of the case and which powders we were going to burn and how much of those powders, yep. because you were started, yep. you mentioned Superformance earlier and making those powders. So I know, 
it had to have something to do with this one because we have notes in here of trying to hit certain volume numbers of the cartridge case. Well, I think we decided very early on we were not going to do a, a, a ball powder in this because we wanted the temperature sensitivity that the Hodgson... For the, we, we, for ba the we based load. it from the get-go on Hodgson And I know extreme. 40... I have 40 grains of powder, so I know we settled around plus or minus, but mm -hmm. we wanted about 40 grains of powder yep. in there for the 264 uh, diameter barrel. Look at this. A hundred free bullets when I buy these select Hornady reloading tools. Wow, 500 free bullets with certain Hornady reloading presses and kits. Well, what do they have? Let's get loaded. There's no better time to stock your reloading bench. Choose from the most durable, precise, and convenient tools on the market and receive free bullets to get you loaded. Visit Hornady.com for further details. Next time we get loaded, I'm buying. Perfect. Well, that was a, a good set of parameters, you know, performance parameters. And how did that rubber meet the road here from getting back to the factory and, and getting Black ops. Yeah, getting things, I, dyes this, ordered. Exactly. I knew he was going <laughs> to ask this question. I said, that turned into one of Neil's uh, patented black ops programs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it wasn't called 6.5 Creedmoor. It no. was like... Well, 6.5 30 TC. Because well, we took 30 TC cases and they were head stamped that. And then we formed them, obviously, with different... Oh, here this, it is. This, this was data. another one of those where we knew we had to have data and information and one... One of those where Steve could have legitimately said, you SOBs never tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which we've been told that a few times. Yeah, I heard yeah. him say it yesterday. More than a few yeah, times. Yeah, it, yeah, it came into the 17 HMR conversation. <laughs> That's funny. Yep. But yeah, but, it, was a, it was a black op. I mean, these guys set out and developed the cartridge. Um, yeah, Neil, yeah, Neil basically said, hey, get me some data, get me something i can hold and then i'll run with it i'll go stick my neck out and talk to the Business. boss yep so, so once it was developed then <clears throat> either you either just me or you and i went and I chatted with jason about it because jason i think was my boss at the time yeah he was and uh I said to him you know hey we got this this is this is what's going on and he said well you, you need to call it the six five TC, TC, right, was kind of where we yeah, were. But we collectively, and I'm certainly not taking any credit for that, but we had decided to call it the Creedmoor as an homage to the conversation with Dennis, with Greg Kentorovich yeah. there and everything well, like that. Uh, yeah, the historic and Creedmoor ranch. Yeah, the Creedmoor, the Creedmoor yeah. match. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, there's a lot going on there. It's, it's a very mm. good historical tie, which looking back now is kind of interesting because I don't know that we gave it much thought then, but that was the first time that a cartridge was named for a, not a gun maker, or a, really an ammo maker necessarily sure. at the time. So it was kind of a unique, yeah, unique well, name. And the, the, this One was of the a, first, anyway, commercially available. Yeah. This was a huge departure from normally what we did at Hornady, hunting cartridges, hunting bullets. Now we're, we are building a match yeah. cartridge yeah. to start with, which is yeah. different than we had done in the past. When you guys were doing that development before you kind of handed the baton to Neil, was it an easy type development? Obviously, you, you knew kind of what powders you were you were looking for. You knew the charge weight. Uh, you get some reamers in, get barrels chambered. Uh, did it just kind of fall into place, the temperature sensitivity, the accuracy, the consistency? Um, once we had the cartridge in chamber and we got the reamers in, we built, it took us, I don't know, I had, the stuff in here I have is probably eight months before we had the cases right. From the notes that I, we changed tooling and manipulated stuff. And then we had cases in February of 07. Mm. And we had Dennis sent us a rifle. We had a P&V barrels and stuff. And yeah, I remember from the get-go, it was so easy to get it to shoot good. I mean, yeah, it right. was, it came, the accuracy just That's That's came what I remember, easy. that it, it really wasn't, you know, a big deal to get this thing to shoot the way we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. So we knew we had a good... Yeah. Obviously, we weren't waving the victory flag, but we're right. like, hey, this works pretty darn good. We did 120 and 140 grain bullets to yeah. start with, I remember. Yeah, we did the 120 for the short range and then the 140 for the And that was part range. of the recoil management. Oh, so sure, you're going to shoot sure. it, yeah. you know, two and three, you could shoot 120 grain bullets and then 
uh, when you're belly sheeting, you can shoot the 140s. 40. And I as I recall, the 120 load, we didn't really even, we didn't or load a 120 and, load to max either. We kind of no, kept it a little no. more modest. We did push the 140 right up near the top, but the 120, we didn't. Yeah, it was kind of a. We didn't push it real hard because we were trying to get a really low a recoil. recoil load. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, uh, at least when I was working in ballistics, there was just certain things that just worked. That it was, it was just effortless. And that always. Like you said, you don't wave the victory flag, but they just give you a warm and fuzzy. And every time you go to yeah. do a test, it just works. And it's very, very satisfying. And it, you can almost, it's almost like a premonition that you, okay, this is going to be a home run. Like when Jaden was really working on the six arc there, it just worked works. every time mm. that he did a temperature test or an accuracy check, or we were looking for P and V and looking at extreme spreads, it just worked. And then we get guns built and we take it out and shoot it and it just flat works. Uh, there was just something easy about yeah. that, and that's very assuring. And I was glad to hear that the 6.5 Creedmoor, during your development, was also just kind of fell into place because uh, it obviously has fallen into place for a lot of folks. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to mess that up. Didn't know that at the time. Obviously, you're approaching it. So you get the cartridge developed. You get your performance criteria met with the loads, velocity, the recoil, the accuracy, all of these things. Uh and then you hand this off to Neil and, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know about handing well, it off. We did because people but, shot it that year. In yeah. 07, people kicked some serious butt with this cartridge. But it was 07. still uh, under the radar. You okay. Know? Still I mean, black we were, ops. Yeah. It was still, at least it wasn't a, an officially blessed potential right. new, new yeah. product for us. Okay. So, so then we Jason had to go says and sell it's it. going to be the 6.5 TC. And you guys said. Yeah. And we were like, ah, I don't know. I don't, that's not, that's not our vision anyway. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that was, you know, we, I don't know, I don't know how we fended that off, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't just remember. Kick the can into well, I, as I recall, uh, sometimes it, the trick is just have some brass that's head stamped. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And maybe, yeah. and yeah, maybe we did yeah, that. Maybe, I, don't I don't know. know. It worked oh, for this, me. This, I don't know what you're talking about. Just doesn't get I, out I think, it, <laughs> didn't it kind of go that Dennis, Dennis did have some pride of authorship with this, which he justifiably should have. And he kind of said, you know, I'd really like to create more name on this. Something like and, that. And we and went I to, mean, to Jason with that and he said, oh, all right. I think so. And then and then he said, all right, now you, you got to go down there and talk to dad. Yeah. So I was like, all right. He said, you, not we? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, said, I, I, I don't I, know. He was busy, but it was like, yeah. right. So our kind of our product intro timeline is typically right around the well, it's not really the intro, but it's kind of when things become officially official is for the, what was then Prime Media or Intermedia, now OSG uh, editorial roundtable, okay. which is uh, usually the last part of July or first part of August. So now it's, the, we're going to make this real by talking to people outside of this building and maybe a select handful yeah. of people. So now we got to make sure it's cool. So he said, you need to go talk to dad. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, I, the one thing I knew was historically in the past, when we do a cartridge, it's it's always in conjunction with a commercial firearm manufacturer. Right. And that's an easy way to get things rolling. So like, oh, what are we going to do here? Well, I was really good friends with Dustin M. Holtz at DPMS. So, and he, that was Randy Luth on DPMS back then. And just great group of guys. I still to this day, I have immense amount of respect for Randy and what they did for ARs over over their tenure he's a great guy and uh, and um dustin too so i called dustin up i'm like hey man because they had a they had a ar10 and 243 and obviously 308 and they they, they weren't afraid to do different things okay like they just not afraid to be different uh, it's just a barrel i mean a barrel and a few other you know things i don't know what they'd have to do to gas block necessarily but anyway so i called him up it was really quick hey man we got a new cartridge it's a 6.5 creedmoor blah, 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 blah. Would you, would you be interested in chambering it? He goes, yeah, sure. Just like that. <laughs> so, Off the yeah. so, okay, cool. So now I've got this in the hip pocket. I've, I've got some, some, uh, commercial manufacturer that's willing to chamber a rifle in it. Mm -hmm. So then Dave and I, cause we need reinforcements. Yeah. I remember, <laughs> I remember him coming down the hall and going, come on, we got to go talk to Steve. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we went into Steve's office and, um, yeah, you know, you've got to sell him on it. And, uh, may, interestingly enough, he, when we, we told him about the cartridge, said the tub 2000, we can chamber that. And obviously, uh, DPMS was interested in doing it, would do it. He never said 
no, and he never said, yes, proceed. What he I, said, it, okay. Yeah, what I remember him saying, he, he said, you guys realize that, you know, no, America has really never embraced 6.5 yeah. caliber. He said, you guys know that, don't you? Well, yeah, but this is a special one, Steve. <laughs> yep, yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, so, <laughs> so we, we proceeded from that point forward yeah. and, and it, and it gained momentum slowly over the sure. years, obviously, and we can chat about that yeah. too, but. So it started off as a match cartridge. Well, I mean, okay, it flies well. So what's wrong with a cartridge and a bullet, uh, a bullet that flies well, it's, it's going to have a great application on the hunting side too, right? right? So uh, it wasn't sh uh, shortly thereafter to uh, see people start using it for hunting applications. But the one thing you can always tell, and, and I think we've talked about it in the past, is if you want to know if a cartridge is going to be a good one or not, is when you go up and down the hallway there in Hornady and you people have rifles chambered for something. Yeah. And it was like, everybody had one. Everybody knew that it was the deal. Um, so yeah, it started off kind of in a, in a niche world there on that match side. And then the AR side kicked off a little bit because that was, you know, the Brady bill just sunsetted in 04. So ARs were the rage. Everybody was doing everything AR, AR-15, AR-10. And uh, it started to gain momentum because you had not just DPMS, now you had other companies that were starting to chamber it. But it kind of stayed in that ilk for a while. Okay. Until I think Ruger, Steve Johnson, uh, was a was was our PR guy back then, and he was good friends with some of the folks at Ruger, and uh, just you know they they saw the benefit of the cartridge and they chambered it in a in a hunting application. I don't TC may have too. I don't recall, but that but TC kind of changed they then. Changed too. right then, yeah. Right, yeah. that was when Smith and Wesson bought them, and yeah, I, I so. believe they did. And then but it was a short period of time, right? Right, it wasn't very long. Yeah, and then uh, Savage picked it up fairly quick after that yeah. too. So now it's starting to Popularity. cross pollinate into the hunting side right. too with different bullets. I mean, we had SSTs and. Yeah, two uh, performance, inner bonds even. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually here just uh, last year, I think, I was talking to Ken Byers of Byers Media, and he yeah. remembers having a conversation with you, Dave, talking, if we've got this cartridge and w this this ought to be perfect, we really need to get up there into South Dakota and, and take this on a deer yeah. hunt because this is, this is the next best thing. Well, I, the one I remember the most probably from the hunting standpoint is when we did the 120 GMX and put it in that. In South Africa? Yeah. yeah. That changed. And, that and, shifted and, gears. And most yeah, of the yeah. riders were like, man, oh man, does this thing ever give you terminal performance yeah. on pretty big animals? Because it was a little bitty cartridge. Yeah, it was yeah. a little yeah. bit. I, I can remember my peak pH going, mate, what are you going to do with that bloody little thing? Yeah, because <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, like, everybody goes there with some Magnum yeah. cartridge. And, and, and he asked me, you know, well, can you shoot the thing? And then, well, go put a target on the fence over there. And I, yeah. off of his headache rack, I shot a three-shot cluster that were all touching. He goes, bloody hell, mate. That's pretty good, you <laughs> yeah. know. Because yeah. most of you Americans can't shoot like that. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that initial period. People are shooting it in matches. You know, the Camp Perry stuff. The PRS, not a thing at the time. Uh, but those sniper matches and field-style matches, you know, in the 2007, 8, 9, 10 time frame, becoming more and more popular you mentioned george gardner with ga precision yeah that, that kind of sport uh growing and then you see the shift into the hunting world with the creedmoor where you mentioned dave the 120 gmx the 129 sst and it probably had a a, a little growth burst in that time frame maybe 2010 to yeah 2013 yeah, right. or yeah. so i would say 2010 was right around when it really started to take off yeah and i mean yeah, so the hunting stuff kicked off. Yeah, it is. It's the it's the overnight success that took ten years, um, but it was just incremental things. And people would, people or sports or disciplines would kind of discover it, but at different times. Oh sure. Um, but yeah, once that field shooting stuff kicked off, that was a big one. Mm -hmm. It just made perfect sense. You didn't catalyst. have to load ammo. I mean, you. Certainly, certainly could because the load was printed right on the yeah. box yeah. for the longest time i can remember some of the first hunting articles that were you know 10 11 maybe and the guys just kept going on and on about how boy this is just such a comfortable easy cartridge to shoot and they said it is just phenomenally accurate you mm. know and it's, these bullets are effective and you know why would you 
in the 308 30-06 30 class, cartridges want to shoot anything other than this thing because it's just yeah. so pleasant to shoot, and yep. it's got such long range capability. Yeah. It certainly yeah, we does. did. It was a TC. TC did chamber it. The reason why the Warlord Alpha Brain's kicking in. Yeah, is uh, we went there with TC yeah. to South Africa. Mine was Carl a six. Ricker was yep. there with mine us. was a six five yeah. Creedmoor. Yeah, and I know yeah. the Warlord Aaron that Carter. you mentioned was yep. chambered in six five. Yeah, Creedmoor. so I mean they did do it, but um, yeah. So once this field shooting uh, kind of you know back then I think it was sniper matches is what mm -hmm. they were termed that started kicking off and the PRS became a an organization and. And there was a 6-5 race where yeah. were, a lot of people really. shifted from 308 to 6-5. Sure. And then, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but in my opinion, uh, I was taking phone calls at the time, 30 to 50 phone calls a day. There was a marked shift in 2015 with the ELD match. And the ELDX oh, for that matter. Yeah. But the Creedmoor, uh, the phone call volume and the request and the, i need more information on this why didn't i hear about this before how long has it been out the six five or just that no load? six five and six five creed more specifically oh. i feel like once that eld match bullet came out in the 140 in our in our match ammunition it it felt like that was a knee in the curve that well another another thing that happened was so all these rifles that people were shooting you know robar uh GA Precision, um, you name it. Some of the some of the HS Precision. All these folks that were making rifles. Well, they're 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 not um, super economical. They're not. Yeah, they're not. They're not. They're not. It's a premium, they're not inexpensive. Yeah, it's a premium shall we say. product, and yeah, they demand and I mean, a premium it's, it's price. It's the sum of the parts, and they mm -hmm. all make phenomenal products. But Ruger came out with the Ruger Precision rifle, which was every man's. You know, quote unquote sniper rifle. Mm -hmm. Joe, you were on the event for about a Texas. thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. and here you can have this rifle that it's got a chassis, it's chambered in a cartridge that's applicable for these sports. Uh, it's six five Creedmoor. It's got detachable magazines. It's modular. You can do this and that to it, and that really helped. They sold I don't know how many of those oh, rifles. Yeah. So Joe that, bought the one that he tested. Yeah, sure. nice. Yeah, still have it. Yeah. So, I mean, and that, that would have that been was... probably not, yeah, 2016 probably with that or 17. It had perhaps. to be right there because we were shooting ELD matches. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you, you figure, okay, so if Ruger does that, what happens next? Other gun manufacturers start doing something similar. So now everybody is getting into precision rifles. You can you can pick the level of, uh, of entry for yourself. So sure. if you want to have a production gun that is quite economical, that shoots well, and or if you want to go to a custom, semi-custom, you can obviously go there. Sky's the limit. So that that really helped that cartridge yeah. as well. But then you know the best form of marketing is word of mouth. So enough people start shooting these uh, six five Creedmoor cartridges, they start to realize how effective it can be. Yeah. And uh, it just kind of took off. It really did, and I think the ELD match ELDX bullets really helped propel that. And it probably would have happened otherwise. But man, those bullets. The consistency, the accuracy. You talked about the economical rifles that were out at the time. You know, when you can get the three hundred and fifty dollar rifle, and then the full custom. The the equalizer, though, was regardless of where you were at on that spectrum. The factory ammo shot well. Yeah, and then oh, yeah. And yeah, that was it, you never had to question that, and that's true today. Like uh, I feel spoiled uh, being young in this industry because that's that's how I came up in this industry where. You could just get a factory rifle of almost any, you know, price point and get factory ammunition and it's going to perform well. And those bullets really, really helped. And that ELDX bullet, at least in my opinion, I think that also really helped propel the, the Creedmoor, which had already been established in the hunting world, but it just solidified it. You had a bullet that didn't give up anything on accuracy, didn't give, give up anything in external ballistics, and then still had that terminal performance that uh that you that you need for mm -hmm. a you know a big game hunting rifle uh in my opinion anyway i think that eldx was pretty important in in making the gun builders have hunting rifles not just you know the ruger precision rifle match yeah, right. kind of stuff yeah, for sure but now mm -hmm. hunting rifles. hunting rifles and i mean for many folks and the the six five creedmoor sales at certain points in their production cycles sold more than all other chamberings combined that's so still true today i think you know i mean it's been a it, and it just does a lot of things really well and i suppose we should chat about that some i mean they're 
it's it's fun to get online and everybody wants to the, the haters are gonna hate and mm-hmm. oh it's a terrible cartridge it's this and that it's like okay yep. <laughs> hey that's fine go shoot something else because there's millions of people that do not agree with you so um but yeah every fall i start getting messages from from people in the industry that have got an elk hunt they're like hey man is a is a six five creed more good enough for elk hunting and i'm like yep every day and twice on sunday yeah. just with the right you know, bullet check your and numbers right and make sure you're sure. you know yep. stand within the capabilities of the bullet and the velocities that you'll be at yeah. and and remember you're going to get a little little free trajectory up there in the thinner yeah. air so well and dave you mentioned you took it to africa and at the 10 year anniversary of the creed Morg, uh neil i know you were with uh, outdoor writer joe kurtenbach yeah and also took that to africa tell mm-hmm. us about what was on the menu there and how that cartridge performed um yeah so what did we do we had the uh, heart of beast gimps buck uh probably a zebra and eh, might have been yeah so, I mean, some large animals. That's yeah, why. Gems buck, not an easy animal to take down all the time. No, uh, got large adrenal glands. And, and that's why the whole elk conversation comes up and people are always like, oh, I don't know. You know, they need to be in some kind of a long action cartridge or something. And Sure, there's lots of good choices, but I, I contend that there's so many people that live in the Rocky Mountain West that just, they have what they have. Right. And if a kid grows up with the 6'5 Creedmoor, that's what they're going to use, and it's mm-hmm. perfectly fine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we shot, at that initial trip, I remember we shot Waterbuck, oh, Kudu, wa- Kudu, a lot of small uh, game. Uh, Wildebeest, um, Wildebeest is took a, an Eland with it. Yeah, I shot an Whoa, Eland. Yeah, zebras. An Eland, 2,000 pounds. Yeah, that's a yeah. big animal. So, I mean, if you if you stay within, like, just with every cartridge, yeah. if you stay within its capabilities, yeah. you're good to go. Yeah, and uh, what the Creedmoor has in spades is if you want to pull, put the bullet right there, you can pick a spot and put the bullet right there. Well, that that's what I remember with, with my pH. The first animal I shot over there when we got there was a, a wildebeest. Yeah. And, and we stocked these things literally crawling on our hands and knees for like a 1,000 yards. And we could get about 325 yards from them. And uh, we were sitting in some rocks, and he goes, can you, can you hit it, Dave? <laughs> Who'd you have, Dave DeConing? No, it was uh, Gary. Gary, okay. Uh, but I, I looked at him, I said, where do you want me to hit it? A little bit high, right behind your shoulder. Okay. And there was about a 15 mile an hour crosswind. And I shot and you could see lungs blow out the other side. And he's, bloody hell, that was a good shot. You know? <laughs> he's all excited for you. Oh, yeah. He was jumping up and down. And then I think uh, the other, I had a think a kudu up the side of a mountain at like 415 yeah. yards and i and he was like oh my god you know he's just going on and what do you call that cartridge again yeah and aaron yep. carter yep. shot a kudu at about 400 yeah wow. um yeah but yeah it, it's a great cartridge for i mean everybody should have one that, yeah. that's just a thing like and and one during why do you gotta be stuck to yeah. one? well yeah. okay we own start, like four let's of start with one <laughs> i don't know how many i have yeah but i mean like so i getting guns kind of sorted out for my kids when they were younger and I kind of struggling. And it's a great point. When I was here in Nebraska, when I was a young guy, the, the cartridge was 243. That's what it was for. That's what a kid yeah, starts off with because it's not too big for prairie dogs. It's just right for deer. Uh, it's also good for coyotes. Elk hunting wasn't necessarily part of the thought process for that. So it was a 243. So I was like, you know, just from, nostalgia standpoint i was like ah, i should maybe get him a 243 but then i'm like ah, it leaves a little on the table so like an idiot finally i'm like yeah fool come on make them some six five, five grade more so we did yeah. and there's no looking back because they've got something that'll again within the limitations of the cartridge it'll yeah. do what you want it to do yep um and it's it's not too yeah okay <laughs> prairie dogs well i've used them on prairie dogs i have too oh, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Out to about a thousand yards <laughs> yeah 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 i shot one with my DPMS AR-10 in Wyoming, it took me all morning, man. <laughs> I don't know how many rounds I, I must have shot with a thick, like a 10 power scope. Anyway, I got one at like 800 yards, but it was just by luck, man. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, volley fire. So they'll work for prairie dogs. Um, great for antelope, great for deer. And then it's certainly applicable for animal like elk. Yeah. Again, with the right and bullet. planes game, right? Yeah, the planes you know, game, the right circumstances. So you mentioned the the kids thing that that right there. You know, Joe, you've got yeah four young kids at home, and that's just a perfect cartridge that's capable. 
it's it's certainly authoritative on on our midwestern deer and it's not knocking the snot out of a 14 year old girl no No, they can go shoot this gun for hours Mm -hmm. all the kids do and we own like we have like five creedmoors truly Christina shoots it. I like shooting it. How do you know? I mean, I know Dave likes shooting it, but my kids can shoot it. They start shooting it like 10, 11 years old, Mm -hmm. put suppressors on them. It is great. It's great. So it just, I just love how versatile it is. It does so many things so well and it's so accurate. That's the, I mean, the the best, the best story I have for that is I did long range hunting classes for military down in New Mexico. I was there and Part of that was because we could get very, very high angles of fire at very, very long distances. And I had 5th Special Forces Group come down, and they wanted to go shoot long range at high angles of fire. It's a difficult it, task. Oh, yeah. And the, right in the middle of the, uh, the area that the whole test facility was in was a 7,200-foot mountain peak. And literally, you could take about 10 yards to the north, and you'd step off of you know a 1,200-foot cliff. Yeah. And I had a target out there at 1,550 yards at about a 27, 28 degree downward angle. And these guys all came with 300 wood mags and they were banging away for 20 minutes trying to hit this thing. And I don't think anybody ever hit it. And I just sat there watching and slowly set up my TC Icon hunting rifle. Woodstock, right? Yeah, Woodstock on my bags and watching the wind for five, six minutes and got out. Hornady Ford Sh- off. Shameless marketing, Hornady Ford off, <laughs> yeah. and punched everything in it and, you know, sighted over it and put my angle in and all that kind of stuff. And my first shot, I hit it three inches right of the center of a six-size <laughs> yeah. target. And I hit it three more times in a row after that. And I said, that's it. I quit. I'm yeah. not shooting anymore today because all I got coming is a miss now. <laughs> and you're not a slouch behind a rifle, Dave. Yeah. I mean, there's some but of that those, too. But those guys all saw me do that and they're like, what are you shooting? Uh, my 6.5 Creedmoor hunting rifle. You got any more ammo? And, <laughs> and I had about 100 rounds of 147s with me, and those guys shot up every single round I had. I got to get one of these things. Yeah. You do. You do have to get one. It's, uh, it's a great training tool. Uh, it bucks the wind great, and low recoil. Barrel life is fantastic. Find the latest shirts, hats, hoodies, and accessories that you see here on the podcast and much more at HornadyGear.com. Um, we've talked a lot about hunting on the precision rifle world, you know, early on in the 2012, 13, 14 time frame, it felt like it was a six, five race. There was a lot of people going to six, five mm. and then in Sixes. probably 17, 18, 19, then it was a six millimeter race. And now where we're at in 2023, I almost feel like there's just a little bit of a shift going back to 6.5 6. and there's a lot more 6.5 Creedmoor shooters. But you shoot at the shooters. PRS match last weekend. Hornady, 6.5. Yeah. Creed, 6.5 Creedmoor. I mean, so a lot of folks east of the Mississippi where the wind isn't typically just hellacious. hellacious. Sure, six is cool. But when you go west, west. It's, it makes sense to start yeah. using the 6.5, especially if you're shooting longer shots. Sure. Yeah. And one of the things that, that I've, uh, I got sucked into the six millimeter race as well, and I don't shoot a ton anymore competitively, which we <laughs> quote, for this air, year, air quotes this competitively. Year. <laughs> But, uh, You've been busy, man. Uh, it's still one of those things where, oh yeah, I got this hot rod six. Yeah. And 950 rounds later, I'm spinning up a new barrel and at a thousand, I pull it. And it doesn't take you that long to shoot a thousand rounds when you start shooting a match that's 200 rounds per match plus yep. load work up and practice and barrel break in. And uh, that 6.5 Creedmoor, yeah, you're going to get... I overheard Rick Reeves double or at, triple a, that. at a PRS match years ago and he... Some guys ask him, you shooting a six or a six, five? And he's like, man, I shoot a six, five. I already go through seven barrels a year. He's like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. So if he shot a six, he'd go through, I don't know. 20. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you definitely get more barrel yeah. life. But yeah, that, that little bit of transition going back to six, five, especially for those field matches out West, like you'd mentioned, uh, Neil, that, that match there in Utah, you've got extreme ranges. You've got extreme wind. You've got wind gradient. You've got upward drafts. You've got your hands full in regard to wind and uh big heavy six five i say big and heavy in the grand scheme in the of gr- things they're not sure they're not that heavy but but in the prs world 150 grain bullets a whole lot different than a 105 and a 110 yeah yes it's, they are yeah the third more but you get the barrel life and you get splash you get you splash get, exactly you get so the wind misses. performance and then there's a uh kind of an intangible but you experience it when you're behind the gun is 
you know, 153 grain A tip out of a 6.5 Creedmoor doing, uh, gosh, I don't know, 20, 2,750, 2,700. 2700. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just that little bit of lag time while it's in the air, not actual lag time, but the time between you pull the trigger and you get sight picture again, you can see that bullet coming. Yep. And when you're shooting a hot rod six doing 3,000 feet per second, it's there right now. Well, it's there now. Yep. yep. So yeah, you get that. And uh, I think back to my first custom rifle, which was a 6.5 Creedmoor and a Bartland medium Palma, which is kind of a small barrel contour now for the world of match shooting, but a uh, medium Palma. And I beat the snot out of that thing. I ran it hard its entire life. And I probably got, I stopped counting rounds when I pulled it out of service, quote unquote, for competitive stuff and set the chamber back once. It's still shooting. It's got to have north of 4,000 rounds on it. And it's well past its service life. But I shoot 20 Fowlers. I've got a nice rifle for prairie dogs, coyotes, plinking, practice for PRS, barricade practice. And uh, I, I don't think I pulled it out of match life until 2,700 rounds or something. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe yeah. closer to 3,000. And uh, that, to me, was awesome. So shifting gears now into present day 6.5 Creedmoor, I feel like, man, it was probably 20, maybe pre-COVID or right during COVID, it became the cartridge everybody hated to love, so they loved to hate it. And the internet talks. Yeah, it's and just, there's people that, What a form of flattery. Yeah, everybody's got a keyboard. You should get a license to run a keyboard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I say that because I, I've had that question for magazine articles and stuff where a writer will co- call me up and, and want to visit pointedly about, you know, what what's that like? Uh, honestly, it's kind of a form of flattery. It's kind of like uh, having a, a Ford Mustang, right? Yeah, you know, what, a lot what, of people make fun of Mustangs, but it's still, you know, you can still make those pretty darn fast. But the sales numbers tell a whole different story. Yes, they do. So yep. America is a two two three nine millimeter and six five Creedmoor country. That's, yes, that's what is most popular. Yeah, it seems to be. I mean, and during I always, the during the COVID deal, I mean, we couldn't make enough of anything, but those were the yeah, those, those were, were the, the staples. Yep. So the Creedmoor. A little bit of a slow burn, but boy, when it took off, it took off. And uh, they mentioned everybody hates to love it, so they love to hate it, and it gets its share of press and publicity. Uh, and what I usually tell them is, if the cartridge didn't have merit, I don't care what kind of magician you have on a marketing team, you can't prop up something that won't stand on its own two yeah, feet. True. And now, many years later, the Creedmoor... We're, we're going yeah. on two decades. And, and I tell yeah. you, I think it... so. I've called the Creedmoor, it's, it's lightning in a bottle, mm-hmm. right? And everybody, it's fun to try to do that again. I, yeah. I think we've we've come close a few other times. Um, but I think it kind of paved the way for acceptance for the uh, 6.5 PRC. Yeah. Just because, again, it really was the first super popular. The, the 260 had some followers, but the 6.5 Creedmoor really became a uh, yeah. the first really popular 6.5 cartridge yep. in 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 america anyway yeah I think and so. then you know acceptance of the 6.5 prc wasn't as difficult as it may have yeah. been if had that been the first introduction right. yeah but well, that cartridge proved to be the 6.5 prc proved to be lightning in a bottle which makes the 6.5 creedmoor a lightning storm in a bottle a lightning storm. It's, <laughs> yeah it's well you, still is a huge you've got cartridge. a cartridge that you know has uh, transcended popularity it is just it's everywhere and Recently, uh, Tyler Friel with Outdoor Life shot a grizzly bear, an inland grizzly bear with it. <laughs> he, Probably not his first <laughs> choice, huh? It was his first oh, choice. Oh, really? Was yeah. it? Oh, we yeah. He was, he, he is the, uh, yeah, he, he supports it and he, he, you know, some people have called this the 6.5 need more and he calls it the 6.5 bleed more. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it really did pave the way. That's a great point, Neil, because it, it helped identify, okay, hey, these guys at Hornady know what they're doing from a cartridge design standpoint. You compare it to the 260, which is more of a brute force approach. And now you've got a very elegantly designed cartridge that lets the efficiency of the bullet do the work. And it becomes very consistent with velocity, performance, and accuracy performance. And then you get the 6.5 PRC and guys go, oh, yeah, 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 they're right. They did it again. And it's kind of the same design methodology than the 300 PRC and the 6 arc and the 7 PRC. And, and now... It, it feels like working with the gun builders and the gun manufacturers. If we come out with something, this going back to the 6.5 Creedmoor really paved the way where now they don't raise an eyebrow. And, oh, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Now it's, 
you designed a cartridge. Uh, we trust you that it, you flushed it out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll get some guns built because we know they're going to fly off the shelf. I listened to a consumer somewhere and uh, he's talking to a friend of his about, you know, man, what do I do? Should I do this? Should I do a 6.5 Creedmoor or a 6.5 PRC? And it was just such a simple conversation because he said, Man, just just consider the six five PRC. It's just a six five Creedmoor Magnum. I was like, well, there you go. That's just yeah. a simple deal. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I I guess I would say you know the the we came close on the thirty TC, but you didn't have the bullets at the time. But the six five Creedmoor was really the first one where y- you went against the norm, which is hey, you know, to have a successful cartridge, you got to have a big case capacity, drive the heck and, out. and yeah. drive the heck out of it. We don't care about BC or anything mm-hmm. else. You just make this thing go fast and it'll and sell. Inefficient, and yep, inefficient. Yeah, inefficient and yeah. high recoil and low BC bullets and all that kind of stuff. It was really, I think, the first time the industry started making the shift to, no, you want an efficient cartridge, which means less capa- case capacity, and you want to give yourself the room in this design to get really efficient, really high BC mm-hmm. bullets, and then the bullet does the work for you downrange. You don't have to drive this thing at Sure. 3,200 feet per second. Yeah. It seems so simple when you say it, but there are still companies that design cartridges that yeah. they're just fire-breathing Jeez. dragons, hot, nasty yeah, speed know. down the drag yeah. strip, and and barrel life suffers, shootability suffers. suffers and accuracy. And accuracy. The whole word, accuracy, recoil, all of it. Recoil, cost everything. to shoot it. Pressure consistency, velocity and consistency, uphill and downhill shooting consistency. I, I think that's still... The old school 400 yard shooting mentality. That's exactly what it is. And Dave. You're you know, exactly right. And most of those cartridges are shooting, to use a vernacular, you know, bullets that have a BC of a brick mm-hmm. because that's all they can get to survive out of these things. And the Creedmoor, you know, there's been a few other 6.5, you know, fire breathing cartridges come out in the last eight years. Mm-hmm. And you look at 500 yards, the 6.5 Creedmoor is caught up and past most of them by then. Yeah, that's a, it's a beautiful thing. And then, uh, you know, in current, you know, 21st century times, we've got 153 A-tip, 135 A-tip. That, you know, that just shifts that performance mm. that much more. When now we've got, I don't even know the right word, but hyper efficient bullet design. And you get those things out of the muzzle, it almost don't matter what the velocity is. If you can get them out of the muzzle, that efficiency of the bullet, you're going to be accurate. You're going to buck the wind. Uh, it's pretty pretty remarkable. And then not to mention the fact that we talked about how the Creedmoor kind of paved the way for this cartridge design methodology and chamber design. It really worked. Well, it also paved the way for cartridges like the six millimeter Creedmoor uh, yep, yep. to to come along. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, a, a pretty, you know, wild kiters are going to wildcat and six five Creedmoor came out. And it was pretty well instantly necked down to six millimeter. Um but uh, what a what a fast flat cartridge that is, and a barrel great, life suffers a, great a little all, bit. A great all around cartridge, though. But I think I think Dave touched on it earlier that we live as you know you go back in history, you know nineties eighties whatever. People had more time on their hands. You didn't have your cell phone all the mm-hmm. time. So now we fast forward, and I think one reason why it took a long time to to catch on, so to speak, is now you think about nowadays how little time you have. Everybody has less time, so I don't have time to be tinkering with loading and tweaking my rifle and doing all that stuff. I want to go buy a rifle. I love to go hunting or shooting. I want to go buy ammo and I want to go do that successfully. And this was, if you think about it, this was one of the first packages like yeah. that. And we've done some since then yeah. that allowed people's time to be more valuable and they could utilize their time for shooting or kids ball or whatever it was mm-hmm. and still yep. enjoy their passion or what they like to do of shooting. You yep. weren't spending hunting. hours in the loading room to go Correct. to the range and shoot for an hour. That's yeah. Cr- yeah. exactly. And I think that, I think just the world we live in, in that evolved enough that it helped push this, yeah. you know, I want to say methodology that we've embraced when we design cartridges and chambers mm-hmm. where we're intending it for ammunition that we build to work well. You yep. do not have to be a hand loader to get optimum performance. No. No, you don't. No. And I think back to, uh, uh, my father and his first six five Creedmoor, and I put one together for dad. Never had one. Got some factory ammo, and this was before it was in the white box when it was in the cardboard colored custom yeah. box. So probably yep. twenty sixteen, mm-hmm. maybe. Uh, and got this gun put together, and it was kind of a heavier barrel, but not super heavy. And, and he sunk some money into a pretty decent scope, and had a range finder that would range a thousand yards and a piece of steel, and and went home 
to the hay field where I did a ton of shooting growing up and you can caddy corner, you can get 1200 yards out of it, but dad on his six, five Creedmoor and, and me on the glass hit his first target at a thousand yards with factory <laughs> match yeah. ammo yeah. in a, in a semi custom rifle and just, just floored him. And without that set of components, you know, with something, an efficient design with factory ammo, and he hand loads for it now simply because he, he, can. he likes to hand load. And, uh, but that really brought long range shooting. The 6.5 Creedmoor helped bring long range target shooting to a group of people that yeah. historically mm-hmm. yep. didn't yeah, have true, access huh? to it. Uh, and, you know, like I mentioned, the range finder and the scope, that all aided to it. But when you've got at the time a 58 or seven year old man never shot past probably 500 yards, lays down on a Creedmoor. Oh, yeah. Give it two tenths more wind, ping! Holy cow! No yeah. problem. Yeah. And, and to and, do it on command. And if you go wants, to exactly. a lot of the, uh, you know, training centers and shooting courses and that, most of the most of the uh, most of the company guns are going to be six five Creedmoor. You go to FTW, they've got a whole stable full of them. Cameo's places. got a whole stable full of ammo there. Yeah. Six five Creed. I mean, and it's just it's, it's just, just you get that barrel life, yeah. you get the performance. New shooters get to learn how to how to shoot with something that doesn't punish him all day right and dave can probably attest to this as he's dabbled in the outdoor writing i know since i work primarily with editorial staff when they get a rifle in to to review it's almost generically going to be a 6.5 creedmoor yeah because they don't want to have to sugarcoat things they don't want to have to massage their results they want to get a rifle in and get ammo in from various manufacturers and shoot bug holes mm-hmm. and <laughs> yep. When you get a rifle in to review yeah. and it's in 6.5 Creedmoor and you get ammo from us and Federal and all the other big names that make 6.5 Creedmoor ammo and you look at the accuracy column in their review and every single one of them is minute of angle or better, it's, That's, it's pretty telling. Yeah. yeah I was gonna say chamber the, design. Yep. yep. Exactly what it is. <laughs> well, it, uh, I, I just uh, wrote an article for Guns and Ammo on kind of an introduction to, you know, what are the considerations for and what do you need for entry-level equipment for long-range hunting? And I chose a Bossberg 6.5 Creedmoor and a DeRuger American 6.5 PRC. Both those guns shot under minute angle with out-of-the-box factory ammo. That's the Mossberg considerably under minute sure. angle. Yeah, and Judd, who's back here <clears throat> filming for us today, yeah, he'd probably fight you about a 6.5 uh, Creedmoor Ruger rifle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. His, I think his, his new bride stole that. From yeah, him. she did. Yeah. 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 She, we might have to get another one on order. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's a great point, Dave, that, yeah, the, the economical rifle, it, you can just get it and, and trust it. And there are, you know, there are there advancements to be made in maybe an aftermarket stock or trigger or something? Maybe. But if you get an out-of-the-box rifle with out-of-the-box ammo, and that I mean, kind you're, of performance. you're literally at the point now where you can go buy a $700 rifle in a $500 scope that will track and repeat well, and you can legitimately go long range hunting or even long range shooting. I mean, it's, you don't have to have these five or $6,000 setups mm-hmm. to go be pretty salty. Yep. That's yeah. And I mean, remarkable. there's been manufacturing improvements from everybody not just on the ammo side but on the gun side triggers are way better than they oh yeah used to be that's a big one i mean for a long time triggers were all like seven pounds or something like that so everybody's got triggers now that are much more friendly uh barrel manufacturing uh, techniques are have improved and then on our side on the ammo side from us and others it's just we've all gotten better and Mm -hmm. i think the shooter the the consumer now is just getting products that are at 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 the at the at the peak and presumably the peak will continue to get higher as, as time moves on. Yep. Um, but you can't change things like a chamber design. No. Now, no you when can't. you start off with that and it's correct and the bullet is going straight out of the cartridge case. It's got to be right. You start with the right Well, the, the entire philosophy of, of the industry now has changed because it's not about, you know, guy's going to go hunting and boy, a long shot's going to be 400 yards and we're going to sell a whole lot more of this 300 wind mag with a 150 grain bullet going, you know, 3,200 foot per second because that's what he wants and that's what he thinks is going to work. And it's, that's not the case anymore. It is not. It is not the case. I think, yeah, the efficiency takes over and uh, anecdotally, I think anybody that knows me, public land mule deer is just my thing. That if I had to pick one animal and one way to hunt them forever and ever and ever, public land mule deer is the thing we should have had that as a question at the end we could have uh, put Seth right. on the spot yeah. 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 so the, my first successful attempt 
at shooting a public land <laughs> public land mule deer. Uh, I'm packing along a 6.5 Creedmoor 143 grain ELDX doing 27 20 feet per second, and it finally happens between uh, in this draw shooting across the draw 417 yards. No question, didn't even think about it. Looked at the wind, dialed my dope, put one through both shoulders, dumped him in his tracks. 6.5 Creedmoor didn't even didn't even think about you know the complexity of the shot because I, I had been shooting this rifle for years and it just it was like an extension of my hand and uh yeah it was a, it was a beautiful thing and uh that was the first animal that i killed with a 6.5 creedmoor and it's like i don't know what everybody's talking about that seemed to work pretty good for me <laughs> yeah i had the same kind of experience too this was probably a couple of years after i was out to lexington on, on truman's place then i uh, hadn't seen deer all day and it was almost you know, it was dusk-ish kind of time frame, sitting on the edge of a cornfield, and here walks two does out and ranged them, you know, 420 yards away. I didn't even have a bipod. I literally leaned against a fence post and dumped her right where she, you know, it's like, holy cow, this is pretty legit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty legit indeed. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of animals in the in the country that are not fans of the 6.5 Creed War, I promise you. Yep. You can have access to the Hornady Handbook of Cartridge Reloading at your fingertips wherever you are with the Hornady Reloading Guide app available for iPhone and Android. Check it out today. It's been pretty fantastic to watch this thing like a rocket sled on rails really become so prevalent. And uh, it's cool to, to sit down and hear the story and have some of the history. You know, Joe's got a notebook from 2005. <laughs> that uh, has some notes in there and to get one of his experimental draw dies or taper dies rather uh, to see, you know, Dave's personal yeah, the, dummy the round personal for a rifle yeah, that, that he still owns, by the way. That should go in a trophy case yeah. out front somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, you think your throat's a little further, <laughs> further down the barrel now? Uh, and yeah, the original size die, the 6.5 dash 30 TC. Yeah, it was just fun to have a little, a little history, but. You better the, take that home, Dave. The <laughs> part of the consistency, you know, people, you said earlier, I think, that um, people ask you, well, why a 6.5 Creedmoor, this and that. And one of the like examples that I use personally with my family is I have a whole bunch of Creedmoors that my wife and my kids shoot, right? So when they start shooting, I need to have a system in place. So when I'm watching them shoot for them to improve in mm. their skill, I have to understand or I have to know that the rifle and the ammunition, the bullet is going where it's supposed to go. That way I know how to help and coach them and make yeah. them better. If you've got a gun that shoots a pattern down there, you, you're you're not helping anybody you know yeah. i can't help my kid get better but if i know if the miss is because of them or the wind or whatever we can improve on that skill and a yeah. lot of people are like oh that makes that makes sense you know yeah you've got and to this, know and this package is tried and true obviously over the years that you know that yeah. it shoots well it's one it's less to variable well. that's yeah. exactly what it is yep so and it's not it's not the only cartridge in the world there's there's oh, yeah. there's a whole no, bunch, there's of a other bunch of other cartridges but, and but Man, if you don't have one, you need to have one. It just does a lot of it does a lot of stuff well. Yep. Um, but you also need the six five PRC. You need a seven PRC. I think you need a seven PRC, PRC for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, man, I it just yeah. If you if you you can find the ammo for it everywhere at this point in well, time. Well, that's a internationally. Sure, it's, yeah, it's overseas. Sure, it's in sure Europe. That it's story, in Africa. Neil, with uh, John Snow. Uh, which one? Uh, when he shot that. Was oh it yeah, Cole? shoot yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, he was in. Uh, he had a he he had an international trip, and uh, he was with another ammo manufacturer. But he had um, see he I think he was in Zimbabwe or something like this. So John Snow, editor for Outdoor Life. Um, so he had a complex trip. He was going to go to Zimbabwe, and then straight from Zimbabwe, he's going to go to Mongolia. So here he is. He, he he couldn't take one rifle one place, and there was a transfer some other place, and having guns in this other transfer location would have been a mess. So he probably used a camp gun or used somebody else's rifle in Zimbabwe or whatever he did and then had to get a rifle when he got to Mongolia. And uh, in Mongolia, ends up with a Tika. I think it was a Tika. Yeah, in 6.5 Creedmoor. So, you know, it's to the ends of the earth, earth Timbuktu. Yeah. 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 So it, it, it's established. And the yeah. first time when we went to South Africa for all those guys, they were enamored. They were, they were, they were awestruck at how well the cartridge performed. But they they were always reluctant because oh, you know we can't get this thing here. It's, we're never going to have sure. a product, so it takes a while. But 
boy, at this point in time, it is global. It's, it's global. everywhere you want to go. Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, South America, Asia, Europe. It's it's everywhere. Awesome. Well, guys, I don't have anything else to add to the 6.5 Creedmoor story, but I appreciate you guys sharing the story you know, going back, like Joe said, almost two decades now. Is there anything else that you guys want to leave the listener with? No. No. Pretty much. We covered it. Yeah. It's well that covered. Is, that is the 6.5 Creedmoor from... Yep. Yeah, and these guys are, I mean, that's who made it right here. These two guys. I don't know who else, somebody else is probably involved with a little bit of stuff here and there, but uh, between Dave and Joe, that's that's who that's who I'm made. I'm pretty the sure thing. we did this one because we I know we yeah, chambered it, the it was bullets chambered were the done. And we didn't have to have new bullets, so yeah. it's about you know designing the cartridge case, the chamber, and propellant selection. Wow, well, well done, guys. On behalf of pretty much everybody in the world that's a shooter, uh, thank you for the <laughs> six point five Creedmoor, and thanks for coming on the show. And black ops Oops. sometimes are worth sticking yeah. your neck out for. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. they yeah. are. Yep, uh, <laughs> yes, they are. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this peek behind the curtain on the development process of the 6.5 Creedmoor, a cartridge that is versatile. You can use it for matches, target shooting, hunting. It's all over the world. It's one of our favorites. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll catch you on the next one.